Jean-Jacques Rousseau's social contract. This will be a lot more straightforward in the way it is presented, logical, clear, than, um, than John Locke. It is a piece of French reason, closely reasoned, and we can follow the argument right along, as we will in lecture, and pick out the more significant parts that on the points on which the argument turns. But nonetheless, while you'll find Rousseau much more straightforward and easy to follow than Locke, he is a singularly frustrating individual to come to terms with. Because Rousseau has been, well, Rousseau has been put on all sides of political questions. He has been called an advocate of pure democracy. He has been called a totalitarian. He has been called an example of the age of reason. He has been called a romantic. He contradicts himself at various points. I will try to make his message clear, and we'll try to talk as much as possible about what he's been taken to mean through the centuries. But I warn you, there are some difficulties here. Once again, in these first weeks of the course, what we are doing is looking at the foundations of liberal democratic theory through the eyes of three of its initiators. Three people who experimented with the idea of the social contract, that very peculiar way of reasoning where you try to prove the necessity and hence the legitimacy of government by asking why people who lived in nature, in a state of nature, would voluntarily <laughs> consent to give up their freedom and join government. And as we see, the three great exemplars of this tradition, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, give very different answers to the question. Hobbes argues that it is rational for people to give up their rights absolutely to a sovereign. And hence, the answer to the political question becomes one of absolute monarchy. John Locke argues that that would not be rational, that a rational person would only give up such rights to government as are necessary to better protect his or her own individual rights that he or she enjoyed in the state of nature. And hence, Locke's answer is that government is fundamentally for the protection and preservation of individual rights. Rousseau gives a third answer, an answer that leads us to say that the individual neither, well, the, the, the answer to the question must be neither that one gives up one's rights nor that one remains apart and always aloof from the community. And so Rousseau gives an answer that has led many people to, who adopt his position to claim that the ideal government, the best government, is a pure democracy, a democracy in which the values of participation and community are stronger than those of individual rights. Now, there are others who follow in the social contract tradition, Immanuel Kant, well into the 1800s, and, um, and in, the, in 1971, the American philosopher John Rawls. It is a long tradition of basic philosophy trying to come to grips with the fundamental problems of political and economic theory. But these three people, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, set the stage for the great alternatives that are to follow. Now, time passes between our consideration of Locke and Rousseau, and it's worth reflecting a little on what happened in that time. Hobbes and Locke are men of the 1600s. Uh, Hobbes writes in the 1640s, and Locke, of course, at the end of the century in the 1690s. But they are a party to a different age. Rousseau is very much a person, a man of the 1700s. His social contract, which is his main writing, is 1762, just a few years before the American Revolution, you note, just about a, about a, a generation before the French Revolution, which he himself helped inspire. And time change and the atmosphere changes. And I suppose the greatest thing that one can say about the transformation from the 1600s to the 1700s is that it's a change in intellectual climate 
The 1700s are the age of the Enlightenment. And it's worth talking about the spirit of the Enlightenment a bit to capture Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now, the 1600s were a pioneering period, a period when science was new and the kind of rational philosophy we're talking about was new. Hobbes, Locke, Newton were individuals who spoke and probed beyond the spirit of their age. But their ideas were not to become fashionable until the 1700s. And then the world was caught up in them. Newton, um, a natural philosopher, Locke, an arcane political theorist, become popular heroes. Very much, I suppose, as today, every school child knows the name of Albert Einstein, um, and we say we sort of live in an Einsteinian age, but very few people today really know more than the rudiments of the theory of relativity or why it's important. They know E equals MC squared. They write it on their license plates. They do various things with it. But very few people understand Einstein. And yet everybody knows Einstein's a genius. Gee, I wish I was as smart as Einstein. It becomes a popular word. Well, the same thing happened to Newton and Locke. They became popular figures of an age. And they inspired a spirit of an age which perhaps did not quite understand them. And if you look at the 1700s, just as what happened to European civilization, particularly in England, but also in France, you see just a marked change in all aspects of culture and life from the 1600s. In everyday life, the 1600s are still dark. They're still vaguely medieval. They're still, they're still traces of the forests, traces of the feudal system, just the beginnings of the commercial revolution. The art, the literature, there's still a muddiness about it. There's still an old fashioned quality about it. But in the 1700s, and certainly by 1750, that all changes. And you've entered a new and optimistic an age, and an age of light, and an age of reason. Because the faith in human reason that came with the new science and the new philosophy was terribly optimistic. Through human reason, people, civilization was going to advance. It was going to get ahead. The world was getting positively better. And, it's reflect, and this is reflected in a graciousness of style and a change in the arts that just captures a pleasant, benign atmosphere. The 1700s are not an age of war. They're an age of peace compared to the 1600s, particularly in England, though in France as well. They're an age when the industrial rev and commercial revolutions are well along, when prosperity is increasing and the standard of living is visibly growing. They're an age of invention and discovery, and they're an age of the intellect. This is the time when the Royal Academies, for example, begin to f form, and science becomes a hobby. Just the way people today sit around with their home computers doing heavens knows what with them. So people did experiments in their backyard and wrote little letters to the Royal Academy about, what, you know, about the various things that they did with light and jars and various mechanical instruments. Benjamin Franklin exemplifies the spirit of the age. He goes out and flies a kite in his backyard. An amateur scientist making discoveries, participating in a sense as a citizen in the great revolution of thought of his time. You see it in architecture. The architecture of the 1600s, of all the earlier ages, is closed. It's dark. There are solid walls for protection. In the 1700s, partly because of peace, the buildings open out, and there is light and huge windows. You see it in the paintings, particularly the portraitures. The paintings of the Enlightenment the pictures of Voltaire, the pictures of Locke, the pictures of Jefferson are very much unlike early, the, of course, medieval painting, very much unlike the stern faces of the Roman emperors or of modern American corporation executives. Watch them. They're all smiling. There's a small, faint smile of reason, joy, optimism on the face of Voltaire. The only exception is George Washington, but as we know, he had bad teeth, and that explained a lot of things along the line. We see it in music, the age of Mozart, rational, light, optimistic, upbeat, a world different from 
the, Gregor, the mysticism of the Gregorian chant, a world different from the 19th century in the brooding of Beethoven, or worse yet, Wagner's celebration of the Gotterdammerung, you know, the, the death of the gods consumed by fire. No, this is an age of human scale, human proportion, balance, and reason. You see it in literature, fine, beautiful writing that we find hard to imitate today. Later, you'll read the Federalist Papers or the Declaration of Independence. Just watch the style. If you can write like that, fine, but we can't do it anymore. We've lost the touch. This is beautiful writing. Now, the Enlightenment came to England, and it's, as I say, it marks the spirit of a century, and it grows progressively through the 1700s, but it goes to France as well. And the interesting thing about the Enlightenment in France is that it is a foreign product. Voltaire thought of himself as a popularizer of, Newton, of, um, of Locke. And the French took it very seriously. The French, in imitating the, um, um, the Enlightenment as it had occurred in England, worked with reason with a capital R. They sought an utter rationalism in all things. And the other thing I suppose to be appreciated is that the environment of France was different from the environment of England. England in the 17th century was a constitutional monarchy. The rights of parliament, the rights of Englishmen had been affirmed in the bitter struggles of the 1600s. And this was the way England had grown into a centralized nation state. But France was different. In France, all power had come into the hands of the monarchy, and by 1750, you had reached, in the reign of the Louis, the strong, central, centralized authority that had diminished the rights of all parliaments, all local governments, of the nobility, of the people, so that government was, in a sense, a very strong, highly structured, centralized bureaucracy. Now, it's into this France, and it's into this world of this enlightenment that Jean-Jacques Rousseau appears as a figure to antagonize and to make a difference. As I said, he was a product of the enlightenment. He spoke in the language of the enlightenment, but nonetheless, he never quite belonged to it. He was estranged from the enlightenment never quite at home in this world. He was alienated. He knew the intellectual, the political, the salon life of Paris in the 1700s, but he always stood apart from it. He wrote an opera, but refused to be introduced to the king, who would give him perhaps royal patronage. He was something of a misfit and an eccentric. He wandered around. He quarreled constantly with people. He suffered depression and mental and emotional derangement. In the end, he sought a, a, soli he sought a solitude he could not find. He left, heritage, he left uh, Paris for a place where he could commune with nature. At one point, he asked the authorities of the town he lived in to imprison him for life voluntarily leaving him just books to read and a garden to live in. Now, the fact was that while he spoke in the idiom of the Enlightenment, he was opposed to the Enlightenment. And in a way, there's a deep irony here. He spoke for another tradition which is emerging, a tradition that was to counter the Enlightenment that we often call Romanticism. Now, the, the polarization between Romanticism and the Enlightenment becomes just part of the cultural history. Of, of the time, of the 17 and eight, 1700s and 1800s. And while the Enlightenment signifies faith in reason, what Romanticism signifies is a skepticism of reason and a deep faith in the instinctual, the natural. And Rousseau, in his earliest works, began to express this idea. His very first famous writing was published in 1749. It was the first discourse, and it came up as the result of a contest. The Academy of Dijon, in typical Enlightenment style, offered a competition on the following subject. 
Has the progress of the arts and sciences contributed to the corruption or the purification of morals? Now, certainly, being the heart of the Enlightenment, they expected everybody to answer, oh, see how the arts and sciences have perfected the more human morality, how better they've made things. Rousseau submitted an essay in which he said, the answer was absolutely not. The progress of the arts and sciences, the progress of reason had corrupted man, not perfected him. His basic thesis was that European society had sacrificed moral the moral demands of human nature to the allure of a purely intellectual culture. It had replaced natural needs with, human, with artificial <coughs> needs. See, society, civilized society, requires uniformity of behavior. It requires, it, it requires predictable, functional, specialized interaction between people. It requires good manners. It requires politeness. And with all of this comes hypocrisy, corruption, unnaturalness. It inhibits and it frustrates human nature. Custom, more, even common courtesy require that we constantly pretend to be something that we are not. And in this way, we become less moral with the advance of rationalism and the advance of civilization. We become less what we are naturally and less naturally good. The checkout clerk at the supermarket with her professional smile who bids everybody have a nice day at the end of every 30 seconds on the dot perhaps creates a nicer atmosphere in the supermarket than if she were surly and bitchy as she might very well feel like being. But one can't argue that she's being natural. It's pretend. It's play. It's a game. It's done because she's paid to do that. She doesn't care whether you have a nice day or not. Frankly, she probably wishes that you had an utterly terrible day. <laughs> but for $5 an hour, she'll say that. Now, from Rousseau's point of view, that's the price we're paying for rationalism. That's the price we're paying for civilization. The basic position that Rousseau adopted is not unlike that which each of us, I suppose, suspect from time to time with greater or lesser intensity depending on our, how we feel about things on that particular day. I suppose for our own age, which is a descendant of the age of the Enlightenment, it's not really clear that technology, complexity, and a high standard of living has increased human happiness. We work ourselves to death to achieve a high standard of living, and we spend our money mainly to escape from things. We have a house in the suburbs so we can escape from the city. We have another place in the Northwoods so we can escape from the pressures of everyday life. We go to school and we learn very complex disciplines like political science or economics or computer science so that we can manage very complex institutions, which often seem to create more trouble than they are worth in the long run. We become dependent on all of these needs and artifacts that we put in incredible stress, effort, and strain to learn. The car, the TV, and they in themselves, in the end, become sources of frustration. I mean, a car is a joy and a wonder to behold until somebody rear ends you on the belt line, until things fall apart, until the alternator falls off one bright morning. They contribute to human happiness. They're a source of frustration as well. Now, perhaps we sometimes wonder whether a simpler way of life wouldn't be better. Sometimes we say that small is beautiful, that self-sufficiency and the joy in everyday things would be a better way of life. And this is what Rousseau, in the first discourse, sought and what he argued. And ironically, for he was the child of the Enlightenment, he made the case for Romanticism in the language of clear French rational analysis. Now, Rousseau's point of contrast to the life of the court, to the light of, seven, of France of the 18th century, to the, light, to the life of a society in the full 
flair of the Enlightenment. His point of contrast was the life of simpler people, the villagers, peasants, <coughs> the mountain people of Switzerland who he had come to know and live among in exile. And when he speaks in political theory, as we'll see, what he's imagining is an idealized Swiss canton as perhaps the ideal of democracy and the ideal of a way of life. The people there spoke their own minds, honestly and straightforwardly. Their beliefs and their values were basic. They, their purposes were immediate and natural, and they were shared. Food, shelter, joy in nat nature. These people were not always anxiously comparing themselves to one another. They were not envious. And their life was tough enough so that they had to share and create a community of purpose. To understand Rousseau's reference point, the life of the peasant, the life of the villager, but particularly the life of the Swiss commune is necessary to understand, I think, his ideal of political legitimacy when we come to it. But Rousseau went beyond just worrying about the state of civilization. To him, all art and science. To him, the accomplishments of Newton, the new physics that everybody was celebrating. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. It was simply a matter of human pride. The villagers didn't care about Newtonian mechanics. They didn't need it. They could live perfectly satisfactorily without it. The great advances of John Locke in political philosophy were meaningless. The people of the Swiss canton knew how to govern themselves democratically without learning any political philosophy whatsoever. All of this was simply a matter of human pride, hypocrisy. Thus, Rousseau argued in 1749, and thus he began to um, his career as a political theorist. Now, Rousseau in that discourse argued a bit of a social contract position and stated his picture of the state of nature for the first time. Now, he stated during the course of his career a number of pictures of the state of nature, but the first one is instructive because here we see a third version of contract theory, a third version of what the state of nature might look like, and it's absolutely the opposite of either Hobbes or Rousseau. In Hobbes, the state of nature before civilization, man, a vicious, aggressive animal, is engaged in a war of all against all. For Locke, man in the state of nature is a rational, calculating, civil individual who seeks his own self-interest but doesn't carry it to extremes and is capable of bargains of reciprocal <coughs> self-interest with other people. But Rousseau portrays the state of nature differently. For Rousseau, before society, primitive man, as he tries to picture him, lives isolated and without complex social organization. Man is a wanderer in the forests. And basically, Rousseau pictures him as a bucolic animal. He finds food shelter easily without competition. Man does not have long fangs. Man is not like the wolf. Man is not structured as an aggressor by nature. Man appears to be a very peaceful, cooperative, unaggressive uh, creature. Uh, and he doesn't need to be aggressive. For when men live in primitive conditions, there is abundance. There's enough to go along. Man in the state of nature, Rousseau argues, is untouched by anxiety about illness and death, um, partly because of natural selection. Only the strongest survived. Interestingly enough, Rousseau anticipates Darwin by about 100 years in this argument. So he pictures man as a healthy creature. The weaklings will die off. And in the state of nature, the condition is one of good, good health. Now, it's a nice picture. In short, the state of nature is directly the opposite from Hobbes. And as I say, it kind of creates a beautiful picture. But Rousseau was not just trying to create a pretty picture of a good natural man to be compared to a corrupt civilized man. 
he was being ruthlessly logical in the Cartesian fashion. He was asking what human qualities are not a product of society. And he would say, well, man's gentleness is not a product of society. That's natural. Man's easiness, his health is not a product of society. That's natural. So what is a product of society? Well, competition is a product of society. Fraud is a product of society. Aggression is a product of society. All of these things only come with social organization. When people live so intensely, see, you're not going to deceive somebody when there's enough abundance to go around. You're only going to deceive somebody in a social order where promise keeping is a norm and a rule. And if you can get away with something, you break your promise. That's what deceit is. Deceit is a function of society. It's actually a characteristic of society. By the same token, um, competition is a product of society. In nature, if you picture these <coughs> bands of people just sort of living abundantly in this peaceful countryside, there's nothing that's going to happen. Competition comes when there's pressure on resources, when people are trying to get ahead, when there's position and power and property to be had. But position, power, and property are characteristics of society, of political life. They're not natural. They're not the, the characteristic of a state of nature. Well, then why did man move from you know, happiness to misery? Why did he move into the corruption of civilization? Rousseau thought it was inevitable. Man would find agriculture, fishing, mining, technology better. It would enable him to improve his standard of living. More people could survive. His national com natural compassion would lead him to care for the sick. And then you begin to create ideas like property, social organization, finally politics. And then you begin to get inequality, rich and poor, master and servant, a division of labor. And finally, you create all the institutions of a complex civilization. Man is corrupt. He's no longer naturally good. He may be virtuous. He may follow the rules. He may keep promises. He may make contracts and keep them. He does not need to be vicious in civilization. But he's different. Well, that was Rousseau's picture in the, as of 1749. That's Rousseau the Romantic, his image of the state of nature. But the lasting Rousseau, the Rousseau that contributes so much to social and political theory, follows from that. But before we go on to that, are there any questions you'd like to ask just about this background, about this figure? Could you discuss um, romanticism a little more? Sure. Romanticism is a lot of different things, but I would say that as, as you will learn about it in other ILS courses in here, the first thing to say is that it is um, a belief in the natural, in the spontaneous, in the unmed uncalculated, as opposed to the rational in the sense of the calculated. A romantic painting is one that evokes emotion and a sense for nature. A rational painting is one that evokes a sense for technique and symmetry and form. A romantic, a romantic poem is more um, a matter of, giving, of, of expressing sentiment and feeling. Um, a, a, a rational piece of writing is one that eschews emotion, eschews intuition, and speaks directly to the mind. So in, in the, in the, uh, it's a celebration of the natural against the contrived, would be one way to put it, a celebration of emotion against reason. These two things are coming into balance. Romanticism is a reaction against the force of the age of reason, which is the dominant motif of all of our age. Yeah? It sounds as though Rousseau would subscribe to the pleasure-pain principle. Rousseau would subscribe to the... Pleasure-pain? To the pleasure-pain principle. Yes, Rousseau, like 
Let me think about that just a moment before I answer. Yes, that's right. Rousseau believes that people are motivated by, um, what, by utility, by the search for what's good for them and will seek to avoid what's bad. That was an assumption that went so deep into that period that yeah, he wouldn't avoid it any more than anyone else. But as you'll see, his thought about that becomes very complex. Okay, now as I say, so far so good. But to look at the Rousseau who comes down to us as part of the legacy of liberal democratic theory, the Rousseau who was quoted as defending the rights of man in the French Revolution, the Rousseau to, of whom today still democratic theorists, political activists cite in defense of participatory democracy, we have to look at the social contract. And we'll begin studying that today. But as I say, it's something we will go through section by section. We'll just follow through the logic of his argument to show what he's trying to say. Because here Rousseau, from the beginning word to the end, is making a statement about the central problem of social contract theory. By, you know, when would a free person consent to be governed? And right at the beginning of the piece, he poses the problem as clearly as possible. The first paragraph is about as famous as any first paragraph in any piece of literature. Man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. Many a one believes himself the master of others, and yet he is a greater slave than they. How did this change come about? I do not know. What can render it legitimate? I believe I can settle this question. Now let's just take that sentence by sentence for a moment. Man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. That's the romantic Rousseau. In the state of nature you can do anything. And yet when we look at man, everywhere he is bound. How bound? The next sentence expresses it. Many a one believes himself the master of others, and yet he is a greater slave than they. What does that mean? Think not just of the person who's the inferior. Think of the leader. The leader who gets up in the morning and has an appointment at 9, an appointment at 10, an appointment at 11, somebody rushing him around, calls all day long, responsibilities to this, responsibilities to this, always being blamed, always being told what to do. The leader is the greater slave than the follower, more bound in, less free from culture, less able to do what he or she wants to do. The person who seems to be in charge of everything is the one who becomes most dependent, less capable of exercising free will. The president must be nice to everybody. The president doesn't have the right of your local plumber to tell off his customers. He has to be pleasant on all given occasions and so forth. Now, how did this change come, about? change come about? Man is born free and everywhere he is in change. Notice his answer. I do not know. He's no longer saying that he can explain historically how man changed from a state of nature to a state of civilization. What can render it legitimate? I think I can settle this question. Now, what he's doing is talking like Hobbes and Locke here. The social contract is not historical, it's hypothetical. The question is if we regard man as having been born free, under what conditions is being in chains legitimate? How could a free person consent to government? When are we morally obligated to accept authority? Why would a rational, free person voluntarily consent to be ruled to be in chains? Well, he begins by, after addressing himself to this question, quite overtly by criticizing Thomas Hobbes. He says, well, there are some answers to this that will not do. And he begins by talking about the idea that government cannot simply be the will of the strongest. He doesn't mention Hobbes by name, but the argument is there. Um, government cannot rest simply on the will of the strongest or the possession of coercive power. If force creates right, the effect changes with the cause. Every force that is greater than the right succeeds to its right. 
As soon as it is possible to disobey with impunity, disobedience is legitimate. Now you'll see that line and you'll reflect on what something that must have occurred to you when you were studying Hobbes. Well, the sovereign is sovereign as long as he can keep order. That means the sovereign is no longer sovereign if somebody mounts a revolution. We said to you, yes, that's right. The sovereign is no longer sovereign. Well, Hob well Rousseau looks at that and says Hobbes' argument is silly. That means if there's a stronger force that comes along, then the sovereign no longer can rule, the sovereign can no longer fulfill the obligations that Hobbes put to him, and it's, it is no longer sovereign. That means what Hobbes is essentially arguing is that the person who has a right to rule is the stronger party, and that won't do. Simple effectiveness or power creates no right to govern. So that's argument number one. Then he looks at Hobbes' argument that a person should give up all rights to the sovereign, and this Rousseau really goes after. The individual has no right to give up liberty, to accept slavery, which is what absolute authority implies to Rousseau. For to accept authority unconditionally, to give up all of your rights to judge government and to just tell the sovereign, you have the full right to decide, um, as Rousseau says, would be the act of a madman, and madness creates no rights or duties. To renounce liberty is to renounce being a man, Rousseau writes. To surrender the rights of humanity and even its duties. Such a renunciation is incompatible with human nature. To remove all liberty from his will is to remove all morality from his acts. The only thing that morality means is that we're free to choose. If we have any, if morality means anything at all, at all, it is that we have the right to choose good or evil. If we give up all of that right to the sovereign, well, we're in Adolf Eichmann's situation, I guess Rousseau is saying. That's what Hobbes requiring of us. Hobbes saying you give up all right to decide to the sovereign. Fine, the sovereign's Adolf Hitler, you're Adolf, you know, you're Adolf Eichmann. He tells you to kill Jews, you kill Jews, that's it. You have no right of judgment. Rousseau is furious, he's outraged. To follow Hobbes' counsel would be to give up all moral judgment whatsoever. So we must retain the right of moral judgment. We would not rationally, we cannot morally renounce that judgment. Hence, freedom of choice must remain under government. And here, Rousseau finishes his damning critique of Hobbes, and in a sense, looks like he's siding with John Locke. But he's not too clear on Locke either, as we'll see as we move along. He takes one swipe at Locke before he goes along, and that is to say that, well, authority cannot be established by majority rule. He argues, how have a hundred men who wish for a master the right to vote for ten who do not? If a hundred people wish to give up all their rights to the sovereign and be slaves, to be Adolf Eichmanns, how do they have the right to vote for ten who do not? In other words, the right to remain moral, to remain free, to remain a judge of the consequences of one's action is more important than majority rule. Now, <coughs> Rousseau does agree that under some circumstances, majority rule is necessary as a convention of decision for reasons we'll see. That it's a way out of dilemmas. But to establish majority rule, he argues, implies unanimity on at least one occasion. We have to agree to accept majority rule as the principle by which we will be governed. And we don't do that except by unanimity. The majority has no natural right to govern. It only has a conventional right if we all agree that the principle of majority rule is the best way of settling an argument. And we might very well do that, but it's a consent that we have to give. Now, Rousseau is making things very difficult. He's ruled out Hobbes's test. He's ruled out the majority test of what counts as legitimacy and he is going to now phrase the question of what would count as legitimate government 
about as severely as it's ever been posed as possible. Because the way he states the problem then is, there's only one kind of government that would be legitimate. And it would be that in which each, while uniting himself with all, may nevertheless obey only himself and thus remain as free as before. Now examine the logic of that. You have, you, you are going, you, you've got to be as free as you were in the state of nature. You cannot give up your right in any way. But at the same time, you are united with others. You are part of a community. You can obey only yourself, and yet you are part of a community action of a political community. Unless that condition is met, government is illegitimate. Now, how are we going to get that? Rousseau is trying to squaring the circle of freedom and authority, liberty and order. You've got to have them both. You've got to have freedom and you've got to have authority. You've got to have liberty, you've got to have order, you've got to have them both and simultaneously. And he's not going to be happy until he defines a condition where both of those can be met and only where that condition prevails is he going to be satisfied that government is legitimate. Well, how do we meet this condition? And Rousseau comes forth and says there's only one time when government is legitimate and that is when the sovereign is the general will, la volonté générale. Now, we introduce this huge floating concept. The test of legitimate authority is the general will. And only if government is expressed by the general will is it legitimate. And now comes the question, what in the world is the general will? Well, philosophers have traced that, tracked that question around for the last 200 and some odd years. And we've argued this, that, and the other thing about what Rousseau meant with, by it. I myself think it is terribly easy to, discuss, you know, to show you what the general will is. But first, we have to look at it and see why it is such a problem. Now, to try to come to terms with it, to try to decide what Rousseau meant by this idea of the general will which renders government legitimate, let's first look at what it is not. First, it is not consensus, and it is not unanimity. For Rousseau tells us that some may have to be coerced in the end. Some may have to be forced to be free. So the general will is not simply unanimous consent. That isn't quite it. And it is not majority rule. We already know that Rousseau doesn't think that. And now, and here's the trickiest one, it is not the sum of private wills. It is not Locke's rational calculus of self-interest. It's not the greatest good for the greatest number. In the, in the classic utilitarian sense of saying we add up all the costs and all the benefits to all the individuals and we choose that part that mostly satisfies most of the people. The reason for this is, that the reason it can't be the sum of individual wills, the reason it can't be the greatest good for the greatest number, is that you're giving up something. You're not as free as before. You may agree on the whole, yes, I, you, know, you know, you may agree, yes, okay. I admit that I have to um, obey traffic signals even though I'd rather not, just as the price of civilization because the legislature voted for it. But you're not as free as before, really. You've given up something. You've made a calculation of consent, but you've, and you've weighed the cost and benefits, but you've given up quite a lot for civilization. You've even given up the idea that you would approve of laws that you don't agree with. You know, you, you, know, you know that as part of your Lockean sense of civilization, that you are bound by laws that you disapprove of until they're repealed. You believe in due process of law. Rousseau would say, that's not quite good enough. That's not the sum of private wills. You have given up something wrong there. You, you are not as free as before if you have to act immorally if you have to act against your conscience simply to maintain 
the principle of due process of law. We know that the general will cannot occur also when the community is divided into factions. For then, each group is voting for one's own cause against other groups. You know, you, 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 um, the general will is not a pluralist balance of interest groups. It's not what happens when you get all the blacks and all the Jews and all the farmers and all the middle class people to kind of get together and vote for one party and that party wins a majority. That isn't the general will either. That is illegitimate government because if somebody's in the minority, somebody's lost that time, somebody is not as free as before. So all the conventional democratic tests of government don't fit. So what could it be? Well, we know the general will arises out of deliberation, because Rousseau tells us so. When all citizens come together to debate a matter of common concern, to find a solution to a public problem. And we know that Rousseau says that the general will is discovered. And from this, I think we can get imagine what Rousseau, or at least I can imagine what Rousseau might mean by the idea of the general will, and it becomes very familiar indeed. It's a natural experience that I think we've all had. Imagine yourself a member of a committee. Let's just assume for the sake of argument it's a student faculty committee to reconsider the curriculum of the University of Wisconsin. The time has come to get rid of this great cafeteria. We're going to do away with 3,500 of the 4,000 courses that this university gives. We're only going to give 500. Most of them will be required. You're on a committee to decide what it will look like. Now, student faculty committee. And you come in, Rousseau it might argue, thinking for the student interest. By golly, I'm going to fight for minimal requirements. Or you're going to say in self-interest, I'm not going to approve any science or math requirements. Not me, baby. Uh, no more of that stuff for me. And you know, all, you know, what you're presuming is kind of a bargaining relationship. And you've also said to yourself, enough of these big lectures. True education has to be in small discussion sections. So you're going to have a maximum size of each class of 20 students. And you're going to fight for that. <coughs> and your student constituency wants that. And you begin to deliberate with faculty and other students and regents about what this new university will look like. And at some point, as the argument goes on, you begin to, th begin to see the larger picture. And you begin to move from your self-interest <coughs> to the problem, the public problem that you're addressing. What should the requirements of the university be? And you begin to philosophize about what kind of an education a person in the modern world needs. And you, you begin to say, well, nobody should get through this university without understanding mathematics and the foundations of science. You begin to say that. And then the argument about class size becomes, starts to come up. And people say, well, sure, we could have classes of 20. All we need is a budget 25 times the size of the present budget of the university, or tuition that's 25 times the size of the present budget of the university. If we had a budget like Oxford, we could teach like Oxford. But we're trying to reach the middle class. We're trying that you know, the idea of the State University of Wisconsin is that every citizen has a right to an education. You know, we do it wholesale. We do it like Sears and Roebuck, you know, we do it cheap, we do it good, and that means big classes. But some of the magic can happen in a big class, it can happen in a small class. And you talk about that and you argue back, but you're beginning to listen. And finally you say, no, I don't want to restrict enrollment. Now think, now watch what's happening. At the end of that deliberation, a report is written. And you who walked in, in self-interest, arguing for two things, wouldn't have it any other way now but that there be math and science requirements and that we retain the large lecture method so as not to restrict enrollment. And you will fight for that. And you are convinced of that. And so is everybody else that has participated in that decision. You are as free as before, yet united by others. The general will has emerged. You wouldn't have it any other way. You have changed your mind. 
your self-interest has now become the interest of the community. And under those circumstances, Rousseau argues, government is legitimate. <coughs> government is as it should be. And under those circumstances, you have no right to go back. You have no right to say, well, in spite of the fact that I'm persuaded of all of this, I'm going to, you know, I don't want to take those science requirements, so I'm not going to. I mean, you know, but the, I, I think, you know, I think everybody should have them, but I hate science, so I'm not going to take them. Now, Rousseau says, doesn't your instinct tell you, after you've come to that general will, that such a move would be selfish and would not be free, and that perhaps the community has a right to coerce you to obey a rule that is in everybody's best interest? Well, as I say, it's a natural act, it's one that occurs, but it's a demanding test of legitimacy. It can only happen in fairly small groups. It can only happen in purposive groups. It perhaps can only happen in the Swiss canton, where the peasants face the struggle for survival, or in communities of common endeavor and common action. The Quaker meeting functions this way, Lots of committees do, lots of corporations do. It's a matter of everyday life. But to put it as a test of legitimacy for a nation is to create a demanding standard of pure democracy. Well, that's a beginning. It's a look at Rousseau's radical proposal. Next time, what we'll do is to examine its implications in much greater detail. We began talking about Rousseau's concept of the general will last time, this test of legitimacy, and today we're going to go on to play with it, to show a hundred different ways that it can be used, what Rousseau might have meant by it, what its implications are, and have been taken to, what it has been taken to be. But let's look again at what Rousseau was after. He was looking for a test of legitimacy that as all the social contract theorists were, that would tell us when government was rightful and when it was not. When a free person would and ought morally consent to be governed without coercion. And as we saw last time, Rousseau had some objections to his predecessors, Hobbes and Locke, about the tests that they had proposed. Hobbes he was most vicious about. But because he thought that the basic Hobbesian logic, that, you, that, the, that the whole question of the state of nature drove man relentlessly to give up his rights to a sovereign was just absolutely false. And he did this for two reasons. One, he felt that what, Rousse, what Hobbes's ideal of the sovereign actually was, in practice, was someone who could enforce the law against people who were always on the verge of breaking it. And that meant that the real test of sovereignty is that the sovereign had a monopoly of coercive force. And once the, once the sovereign lost that monopoly of coercive force, could no longer protect people, you would effectively return to the state of nature, and hence the sovereign was no longer sovereign. And people owed no allegiance to the sovereign. And Rousseau examined that logic of Hobbes and said, look, in that case, all that Hobbes is saying is that might makes right. If somebody comes along and overthrows the sovereign, then they're the new sovereign, which means that civil war always seems to be in order. And it just means that the right to govern falls to the strongest party, that one who can coerce everybody else. And as Rousseau said, force makes no right. But his second objection was the more telling one, and I'm sure the one Rousseau was more furious about. And this was that the notion of Hobbes is that you give up all right to the sovereign. Why? Because a person couldn't retain the right to judge their own case. None of us are impartial. We all see things from our own point of view in Hobbes's universe. Therefore, we must, when we enter civil society and accept government, say to ourselves, we're no longer going to judge. We're no longer going to decide what's right and wrong, <coughs> lawful or unlawful, whether we have a duty or the other person has a right. And Rousseau said, that just simply strips man of all moral integrity. It makes a person a slave. 
To give up the right to decide what's right and wrong is to strip people of their most basic humanity. And that's what Hobbes did. He simply made people robots of the great sovereign. Well, Rousseau's objections to Locke's solution are even more interesting, partly because Locke, comes, Locke and Rousseau are involved in an argument within liberal democracy. Hobbes stands outside liberal democracy. He argues for absolute monarchy. But Locke and Rousseau come down through the ages with an argument that's still among us. And the argument that, a, that Rousseau makes against Locke you can still hear a, in our public debate, in political theory, even today, and it runs something like this. Locke says that the individual will always stand in a relationship of calculation with regard to the state, asking whether the state is protecting his or her self-interest, which is expressed through his or her natural rights. And that the proper stance of the individual is always to look at any action of government and say, is that defending my life, my liberty, my property better than I could in the state of nature? Now, surely Locke talks in terms of enlightened self-interest. And he's really saying that each individual is calculating, is that law protecting everyone's life, everyone's liberty, everyone's <coughs> property better than they could in the state of nature? But what, when Rousseau looked at Locke, what he saw was an individual who always stood a little aloof from the community, who was never really part of it, who was always on the verge of opting out. This is Lockean man, and some people would say this is American man or woman, that you're always looking there and saying when you vote on something or when you're called upon to participate in a project, What's in it for me? And every time you make a decision politically, you calculate whether it's in your self-interest or not. So a farmer deciding whether to vote for Reagan or Mondale says, mistakenly, um, which one of those is going to be better for the farmer? Not for the country, but for the farmer. And you, the students, Many of you voting for, having voted, just voted for Ronald Reagan, now look at the threatened cuts in student loans and say, terrible administration. Why? Because you're calculating that your interests are not served by the administration. And somehow, in your Lockean universe, you've been taught that that's the right way to view citizenship, to stand there and evaluate whether government is serving the purpose of your rights better then they would be served otherwise. Whether government is serving your interests, Locke's man is still, and woman is still, are still individuals that always, whose loyalty to the community is always contingent, and it may go away. Because you, they're always threatening somewhat to drop out. Now, for Rousseau, this was an unsatisfactory solution. And as he saw the dilemma of liberalism, it boiled down to this, that you had to reconcile community and freedom. That people had to be free or they would not legitimately accept government. And at the same time, they had to be part of a community. And that there was one ideal situation in which a person could be united with others loyal to others, in solidarity with others, and yet serve no will but their own. And that was the situation of the general will. Now, as I said last time, the general will is not majority rule, the will of the majority, that, though it may be, for reasons I'll come to in a minute. The, will, the general will is not the sum of private wills. It is not all the interest groups getting together and calculating what will serve the best, you know, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. It's not a series of compromises of that kind. Um, the general will is not consensus. It is not agreement. Because we can agree for all kinds of reasons. We can agree on a common course of action simply because we say, well, it's the best compromise available. But that isn't 
We are not as free as before when we compromise. The general will only emerges in a situation when one is thinking publicly, thinking about a community problem, and having come to a conclusion about what the community interest is, has so committed oneself to it that one would have it no other way, no matter what the consequences for oneself. Now, it's an exceptional thing for this to happen, perhaps, but it does happen all the time, and we know it from our own experience. There are times in our own lives when we act unselfishly, when we vote or we decide in, you know, on public affairs in ways that will hurt our own self-interest. It is perfectly possible for a university, believe it or not, for a university professor to vote for a government that will lower faculty salaries. It is perfectly possible for people to vote on principle, that they feel that a certain kind of government is the better kind of government, even though it will hurt their personal chances somewhat relative to other people. It is perfectly possible for a politician to vote for the interests of the entire nation, though it damages his prospects for re-election. And in all of these things, one is free. One is doing one's will. One is acting freely. One wouldn't have it again any other way, though one is united to others. Now, for Rousseau, then, the general will could only really arise in a certain kind of situation. And that is with a group of people, a community of people, confronted with a common problem, trying to figure out what to do about it. And they had to be in a position where they can discuss and deliberate, inform one another of the consequences of their acts, talk about the affair in common. It occurs, as I say, all the time. It occurs in committees. It occurs in board of directors meetings. It occurs in little groups of engineers who become totally wrapped up in the development of a new design or a new piece of manufacture. They are working for a common goal, so much that they neglect their families, themselves, everything in the process. And in a sense, it's that moment of freedom in community that Rousseau saw, and in the search for the right idea, the willful search not for what's going to be best for me, but what's going to be best for the community. And it's something you almost have to get caught up in. And as I say, you know, you see it all the time. I mean, imagine a corporation, and people tell me this happens all the time in large corporations. There's a moment when the different groups get together to discuss the future of the corporation, and the marketing people look at it from one point of view, the accounting people from another point of view, the production people from another point of view, each trying to get a solution that will serve the interest of their own department. But finally, the meeting begins to gel and take form. And the production people are seeing the marketing people's point of view. And they realize that even though they have this high quality product and they don't want to sacrifice it, the thing isn't selling. And unless they listen to the marketing and the design people, the company's going to go out of business. And gradually out of the, and at the same time, the marketing people who only care about, you know, how it's going to sell, begin to listen to the production people. And out of that, something emerges that isn't compromise. It's agreement. It's the search for the right idea. Now, the right idea may be accepted by consensus. And in this great ideal, and it happens all the time, there's a moment, the Quakers call it the sense of meeting, when you don't have to take a vote. You just all know you're that way. The, it, it, incidentally, it's interesting, the Integrated Liberal Science, uh, Integrated Liberal Studies Department has it prides itself in never having taken a vote on anything. We just rule by, well, it's not even consensus. It's the general will. I mean, we finally reach a point where we just know this is the right thing to do rather than something else. But that may not happen in the ideal case. There may be division. There may be different points of view. There may be a division on what the right policy for the community is. And then Rousseau says, there may be a solution to that which could be the general will itself. 
Somebody, somebody gets up in the midst of a heated debate that's going on that looks interminable and says, let's take a vote. Fascinating. At that point, the idea of majority rule itself becomes the general will. But see how it emerges. Majority rule isn't natural. Majority rule isn't legitimate. Majority rule emerges out of the general will. It is the expression of the general will. We can't solve this problem any other way. Therefore, let's take a vote. Sure, everybody says. And there is what? A meeting of minds, a sense of meeting that creates this. Now, most people would say that this form of government is terribly idealistic, that to, that to insist that every decision be made by the general will simply won't work. There is one community in the world that thinks otherwise, and that's the Quaker Church. And it, in fact, governs itself this way. Um, I've watched this, incidentally, in, not just in religious matters, but in business matters. In a community of Quakers in Costa Rica, who moved to Costa Rica to uh, live in a country that didn't have taxes for military purposes, and they had a farming community where they made cheese and sausage and things of that kind. And I watched them hold business meetings by the sense of meeting of this kind. And you know, they certainly, they defer to the sausage maker or the cheese maker. He'd present arguments and they'd talk about marketing and they'd talk about finances and capitalization and who was doing what kind of work. And the leader didn't really say much except to organize the debate. There were no votes taken. At the end, there was a time when the leader says, well, I think we're agreed on this. Now, at that point, somebody could have said, no, I don't think we're agreed. We've got to talk some more. And in that spirit of brotherhood, gradually will emerge not a consensus, not a compromise, a policy. Now, what Rousseau is talking about when he says this, when this occurs, in this moment, you are as free as before. You sense, feel no sense of personal loss, or compromise with your own self-interest. And you also accept the decision as legitimate, as, bind, as morally binding on you. You would have no right, simply on personal grounds, on grounds of self-interest, to violate an agreement, obviously, in the interest of the community. Now, Rousseau is claiming something quite interesting about this event. First, that we can reason politically as well as personally. That we can think in terms of the public interest as well as our calculated self-interest. And that government decisions are only legitimate when we are thinking about on behalf of other people <coughs> rather than thinking for ourselves. And that's a long way from Locke, or it's a radicalization of Locke at least. When we are thinking not about what we are getting out of it, or about even the reciprocal rights of one another, but what the community, in the broadest sense of the term, is getting out of it. We are trying to solve a public problem, welfare policy, energy policy, rules, regulations, the purposes of the community. And it's not our personal problem. We discover the best policy out of argument by evaluating claims and counterclaims. And in the end, what we are searching for is a rule that we can all adopt and live by and that makes sense in terms of solving a common problem. Now, the implications of this are far-reaching indeed. Because first, what, what Rousseau is claiming is that Government decisions are only legitimate under conditions of full participation. Everybody has to be at the meeting. Everybody has to be thinking. Everybody has to be listening to argument. Not only voting. You know, it's not just the right to vote that's important. But the right to bring up points. The right to pr promote ideas. The right to criticize the ideas of others. Only when we have been a party to the search for a solution to a public <coughs> problem and find that we, by a process of that whole intellectual search for the right solution, are committed to it, can a government be right? Rousseau says this can't be done through a representative government, which he calls a meeting of ambassadors. 
America is not a democracy. Simply voting for people in Congress won't do. Simply voting for the president won't do. Simply, even if you had a wonderful system where you, know, you had a computer in every home and you could vote on yes or no on every bill that went before Congress, won't do. You've got to be in a, in a community small enough so that you can fully argue out every decision. As I say, Rousseau's ideal was the Swiss canton. The examples I give you are corporation boards of directors, committees, small towns, churches. But the question of whether Rousseau's analysis was pertinent to anything like a nation state then becomes very problematic indeed. And Rousseau might say, well, maybe the nation state is simply illegitimate. Maybe that's a form of government that can never be legitimate. Maybe anything over the size of the small community will always be, and perhaps necessarily, a corrupt form of government. Now, uh, this sets a very demanding test for the legitimacy of government, much more so than Locke's, much more so than Locke's indeed. I mean, we're used to using Lockean standards, but when you take Rousseau's standard, that government actions are only legitimate when they emerge out of this mysterious process, you're going to look around the world and say almost everything that happens to you politically or economically is arbitrary and in some sense corrupt if you really bought Rousseau. And perhaps Rousseau intended it that way because Rousseau didn't want to be practical. Rousseau didn't want to find a test that would make it all right in the world and say, gee, things are going on just fine. Rousseau didn't want to say, I will show you a test that will make you all believe that French democracy, is, which, which didn't exist at that time, is the best thing in the world. He wanted to be critical. He wanted an ideal test. And he didn't think that, I, I, I believe, that Rousseau didn't think that government was legitimate very much of the time. After all, he's a romantic anarchist, basically. He didn't like the state particularly. And in a way, he's saying, you shouldn't be accepting this authority. Rousseau was quoted on behalf of, of the French Revolution. Well, in a way, then, we set up an argument um, that goes on through time between two streams of liberal democratic theory. And in a way, some would say Locke is the liberal, Rousseau is the democrat. That you have two ideals of government. The Lockean ideal is an ideal of minimum government, an ideal of government by rights. The majority can't do anything. The general will in a Lockean republic can't will to do away with property. The Lockean majority in, or the Lockean gen, or the general will in a republic like ours can't do away with the First Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment. These are considered to be things that are protected against the actions of political discussion, discourse, and action by the community. The idea of a Lockean society is that there are rights against the people, that the people, that individuals have rights against the community. But Rousseau's universe is different. All, in the end, the, general, the people, as expressed in the general will, are all powerful. And there are no individual rights against that community except those that arise in this process of formulating the general will itself. Now, as you read along in Rousseau, you find a, a marvelous line where Rousseau says, talks about the infallibility of the general will. And if you can figure out that section, you're ahead of most scholars in this field. Because he says, the general will is always right but it does not follow that the deliberations of the people are always equally correct. The people is never corrupt, corrupted, but it is often deceived. The people is never corrupted, but it is often deceived. Rousseau loves to write that way. Paradox, irony, you know, it just flows out of him. What can this conceivably mean? And my own guess is that it's something like this. The general will is infallible, but it is, the general will is always right, but it does not always follow that the deliberations of the people are equally correct. Okay, now, 
There's not one solution to any public problem. There may be a number of solutions. We could decide in such a contested case as that of, the, of abortion, we could conclude probably equally well that the fetus was a person and had a right to life, or we could conclude equally well that the mother, the woman, had a right to her body that transcended, the, and a right to freedom of choice that transcended the right of the fetus. It's an arguable proposition. But if we all came to a conclusion in the light of full deliberation of all the arguments on either side, we would be, in a strange sense, right for our community. We would commit ourselves to that view. We would all see the point of that policy. We would none of us have reservations about it. And for that point of view, from that point of view, the people are never corrupted, but they may not be deceived, but they may be deceived. We may discover that the conclusion we came to after the fullest conversation, after the fullest discussion, we might discover it was mistaken 30 years down the line. Think of it another way about the general will. Consider a scientific community as a formulator of the general will. Think of the whole discipline of physics or economics. You can get a kind of general will there. I mean, after all, for many, many years, mathematicians believed that there was only one form of geometry, and that was Euclid's. There was a general will that Euclidean geometry was true. Gradually, you know, they were not corrupted. They had come to this conclusion for good and sufficient reason. They had tried the alternatives. They didn't work. So the general will was, in that sense, infallible. But it was deceived. Other geometries were possible. Everybody agreed that the, you know, the, earth rota the sun rotated around the earth for a long, long time in the scientific community. The general will was infallible. There had, was no evidence to dispute it. But eventually, it was corrupted. So Rousseau is a kind of a relativist here, but a very interesting modern 20th century post-Einsteinian one in some ways. He's telling you, yes, there's a point, a moment of truth, if you want to, when you do have a common view that is generally accepted. But in that section, I think he's telling you, don't trust it. Don't think it's eternal. Don't think you've somehow hit Plato's eternal verities or something like that. What you've got is a general will, but you may change your mind. You may find out later that it was mistaken. And so the policy of the community, the general will itself, should always be open for renegotiation. Now, the next section in the social contract that follows from the discussion of the infallibility of the general will is equally perplexing. Here, Rousseau talks about the legislator. And just at the point when you think you've mastered Rousseau and you think you've got this picture of all of these wonderful Swiss peasants sitting out in the middle of a pasture with cowbells and yodelers, you know, making up their mind as to what's going on and creating this perfect view of their own affairs, all at once Rousseau tells you, well, maybe the people aren't competent to make up their minds. Maybe they'll never find the general will. All at once he hedges and he becomes practical and realistic. And he says, oh, you can't really expect the people to come to this. They need somebody to help them do it. And all at once, seen right, comes in the legislator, like Hergis, the great lawgiver, the person who will help the people formulate the general will, the charismatic leader who comes before the people when they are confused, when they are in doubt, and shows them the way, articulates the general will, mobilizes them, gives them a sense of mission, tells them who they are and where they're going. And once again, in the presence of this great leader, Rousseau's test is met. You are as free as before. You are united with all. We are going to march on the Sudetenland, or we are going to march on Russia. It doesn't really matter what. We are all one together. We are united. We are brothers. 
we are free and this person has shown us the way. Well, here is the heritage of Rousseau branching into two parts. Because Rousseau has been taken through all the history since he wrote, and Rousseau has inspired since all the time that he's wrote movements of two radically different kinds. Um, today, I would say, in most of the writing about Rousseau in America, in Western democracies, we forget that little section on the legislature, <laughs> on the legislator. And what we talk about is Rousseau the Democrat. Rousseau is the hero of those who would bring us back to industrial democracy, small town democracy, participation. And they, they, they cite, and, and people who are in favor of democracy as against a Lockean free market capitalist society who want the will of the people to prevail over property and individualism and self-interest, they cite Rousseau. But historically, others cited Rousseau. The German Romantics cited Rousseau. The, those who followed Napoleon Bonaparte followed Rousseau. And many would argue that Rousseau led the way to the great leader. Here's a quote from Peter Virek in his famous book, Metapolitics, that shows you a little what this looks like. Rousseau, the Swiss semi-romantic, coined the two contrasting phrases, the general will and the will of all. These, his German admirers used all too successfully to bolster their organic view of the nation. The will of all is the mere sum of individual wills, what modern democracy takes to be synonymous with the will of the people in a Lockean sense. The general will is the indivisible state the state organism's vaster will, what Nazism deems synonymous with the will of the people. Living at the height of French rationalism, against which he only partly revolted, Rousseau never <coughs> intended the general will as the sheer mysticism it became in Germany in the 19th century. The catch is that no objective criterion exists for deciding correctly what man or party is the true interpreter of the state's voice. Consequently, the general will, though never so intended by the more liberal Rousseau, became in Robespierre's French Revolution the mask for the Republican reign of terror and became in Hitler's Germany the mask for limitless despotism. The, the lack of limits. Virick here is talking about the Lockean alternative. In Locke, you always can say no to the appeal of the leader. You've always got grounds to say no. But when Napoleon or Hitler or Gandhi catches the imagination of a people and you stand apart from it, what are you going to say? What right do you have to say no? And in a certain corruption of Rousseau's idea of the general will, you, you get mass democracy, the view that nobody can stand up to the overwhelming majority, nobody can stand up to the mood of the moment. They have no right to stand up to the mood of the moment because that's the will of the people and that's the end of the argument. Now, a couple of points about, technical points about the general will. First, for Rousseau, the general will is sovereign. Now, you know, we, we've talked about the 18th century preoccupation with this technical concept of sovereignty, where final authority lies. Hobbes thought the sovereign was sovereign. It was the last decision maker in the system, the ultimate arbiter. Locke thought the people were sovereign. But now watch Rousseau. He is not saying the people are sovereign, not the majority, not the community. The community merely expressing itself in terms of its self-interest or trying to sum up individual wills or making compromise, that isn't sovereign. And here you get this mystical thing. The general will itself is the sovereign. It's only the people acting in the spirit of the general will that have the ultimate authority. Sovereignty, um, well, that's fine. Now, the, the second thing that should be said about 
Rousseau's conception just technically of the general will, is that the, the general will must be truly general, by which Rousseau means that it's not an act of the general will when the community decides in particular cases or makes rules that do not have universal applicability. Um, here again, Rousseau is reflecting Locke's division between legislative and executive authority. It is the function of the general will to set policy, to set universal norms, to say whether abortion will be legal or illegal. It is not the function of the general will to decide whether, in this case, this woman should be permitted to have an abortion. That is an executive act, and it is the function of government. So, Locke, so Rousseau, like Locke, distinguishes this legislative function, the creation of law, of legislation by the general will, from the executive function, which is to apply the laws that emanate from the general will in particular cases. Government, then, is the, the state, is the agent of the general will. It has no right, it has no force, apart from the general will. The only task of the monarch, the only task of the state, of the bureaucracy, is to apply general rules to specific cases. Now, Rousseau acknowledges that direct democracy is practical only in small states. But he also acknowledges that there exist a lot of different forms of government in the world. And the end of the social contract, of, the, of his discussion of the social contract, is actually a consideration of different forms of modern government as measured by his test of the general will. And he talks about each of them in different ways. For example, while his ideal is this pure participatory democracy, he does acknowledge that aristocracy or representative government may be a possibility or a necessity. Rule by the best, rule by the best educated, the best prepared, or rule by representatives. But he argues that you're always in danger in that case, that a political elite will become estranged from the general will, that it will serve its own purposes, that the aristocracy will think in terms of the will of the aristocracy not the best policy for the entire community. That the Congress or the state legislature will think of its own prerogatives and of its own electoral situation, of its own contributors perhaps, and will not be thinking in terms of, this, of, of, of the same terms that a small direct participatory community ideally might follow. Rousseau concludes that this problem is particularly acute in the case of monarchy when you have the king as the law giver, as the interpreter of the general will. How to secure a king that will follow the general will is a problem. Maybe monarchy will work, but the test of a good monarch is that it is the great lawgiver, the one who follows the general will. The larger the state, Rousseau argues, the stronger the government must be. For the number of individual wills increases. And there are more divergent views. And he raises the question of what are the greater wealth and the power of a large state is worth the loss of the civic virtue of the small polity. Well, in the end, down to today, we have two pictures of the state that emerge from this confrontation of Locke the liberal Rousseau the Democrat. Locke's state, as we said, is generally interpreted as a negative state. Its functions, as we suggested, are very limited. The only thing that the Lockean state can, should do is to protect people's rights. That means basically criminal law, contract law, and a defense force, police force, system of courts. But notice the way Rousseau's state looks. It's a, even his ideal state, it's a positive state. The general will can assign to the community anything. It can redistribute income. It can 
try to create greater human equality. It can create welfare measures. It can determine what's going to be produced. It can determine whether we're going to be in an industrial or an agricultural society. This is not laissez-faire capitalism. And it's a positive state. It takes on tasks. The general will, the community, acts in its own behalf. It's problem solving. It's problem seeking. Now, somewhere there are echoes of that Locke and Rousseau debate in modern American politics. Locke, perhaps, the tradition of the Republican Party, the minimal state, that government governs best that governs least, the market should arbitrate most things. But somewhere in a legacy that runs through Rousseau, through the American pragmatists, through the New Deal, the Democratic Party has a certain Rousseauvian strand in it. That government exists to solve problems for the people. That these should be discussed openly, debated in the public forum. The government should act. And that government should reflect the will of the people. And that these, there are political decisions that may override the market or the rights of property, that in the end, democracy is supreme, perhaps over the rights of property or of individuals when the two come into conflict. So something of this debate is still going on right before our eyes. <laughs>